everybody. It's uh, uh, great to have you all here. And it's great to also have uh, uh, Professor Furong Huang uh, giving a talk today. Uh, Furong is uh, an assistant professor in our department. She works in machine learning. Uh, she works on the more mathematical aspects of machine learning. Also uh, applications. <laughs> and also applications. Uh, and uh, uh, she works on reinforcement learning, on uh, security, and many other things. In the past, she used to work a lot on tensor methods, but now she's broadened many areas. So look forward to learning about her recent research. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ramani, and thanks, everyone. Um, so um, today I'll be talking about, uh, you know, some recent work on reinforcement learning happening at my lab. Of course, at the end of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about my lab, but today let's just focus on reinforcement learning. Uh, by the way, can you hear me with the mask? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, if, if you wish, you can take it off, but it's okay. 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 And number one, and number two, a small thing, because this room is used uh, in one hour, right. so we have to be very strict with the time. Got gotcha. you, okay, awesome. So today's talk is learning decision making systems under adversarial distribution shifts. Um, so reinforcement learning is really an effective way to model an interactive real time decision making system. And it's grounded in applications, high stake applications such as autonomous robotics, autonomous driving, personalized healthcare, market making systems and so on. So in RL, to maximize the reward, the agent makes observations from the environment and then select an action, or you can call it intervention, right? And this intervention would take the agent to a different state, right? So um, the trajectory of the agent exploration in history, which is a causal time series, affects the future, okay? So the history affects the future is no longer IID. Also, the transition dynamics of the environment is unknown to the agent, and that's the difficult part of the learning. So oftentimes, what's more challenging is that only partial or noisy observations are available to the agent. So this is a very brief introduction about the setting here. And now, although proven to have great potential, reinforcement learning have some bottlenecks for practical uses. First is computationally consuming. So real-time online autonomous robotics can be really difficult. And more importantly, reinforcement learning agents often require many samples to learn. At the beginning of learning, the agent will explore the environment in order to make informed decisions. However, the required lengthy exploration during the learning may expose your agent to danger as they often make suboptimal decisions or even random explorations. Okay, so by the way, you should all feel free to just, um, you know, uh, ask questions or, you know, just stop me during the talk, feel free to ask any questions. And I'll also try my best to monitor the chat box. Okay, so crit critical to many high stake applications as we mentioned before, we wanted to speed up the real time online RL. So our goal is to obtain guaranteed data efficiency using knowledge transfer and solve the question of how to learn to adapt to new environments and how to do domain adaptation, even domain generalization. Okay, so this is the first part of this talk. So in most RL algorithms, when we're in a new state or new environment, we basically learn everything from scratch. That is the default model, right? So in this example here of the patrol robots, you can see, you know, if the robot was trained in the daytime with infrared sensors, they might have to retrain everything when the sensor has been upgraded to cameras or when the robot was kind of deployed during nighttime. Okay, so now um, this is not how humans learn, right? If you think about it, you know, when, when we're in a new situation, we usually think about our previous experience, we find similarities, and we try to give a confident guess. 
Okay, so now let's say you've tried the strawberry donut and the mint cookie. So can you make an educated guess about how tasty the mint cookie or the, you know, maybe, may right? So we probably can as humans, but can a machine learning agent also try to learn by analogy to speed up the decision-making process? For example, can a patrol robot use the knowledge collected during daytime and use, you know, using infrared sensors to transfer the knowledge and kind of speed up the learning of daytime robot with cameras, right? So, or can a petrol robot transfer knowledge from daytime to nighttime? So that is the question we're interested in here. Well, this is knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer is not a new thing in RL, right? It's often called transfer RL. Basically, it uses the knowledge learned in a source task and facilitate the learning in a target task. And in real life situations, it's usually not enough to let the agent only benefit one target task. And that's why, you know, we go to like the multitask reinforcement learning, MTRO. So basically the idea is we wanted to train an agent that can work on multiple tasks, okay? So, so there are some existing multitask RL works. You know, they usually extract some kind of model level similarities. In other words, you know, the similarities between the underlying Markov decision process MDPs for these different tasks. And this could be useful when the models are simple and share a lot of similarities. For example, in this case, you know, the first maze is the same as the fourth and the second is the same as the third. So we can transfer the policy learned earlier to these new tasks, right? And they should work very well. However, the knowledge transfer using model level similarities can be ineffective in more complicated real life situations. For example, let's look at this more complex navigation environment with three landforms. Actually, this is still a very simplified example compared to our real world situation. But let's look at this example with three landforms. Let's say we have sleepy, a slippery ice and less slippery marble, and basically non-slippery sand, okay? So the agent take an action that has a slippery probability going to the, the place that I don't mean to go to, okay? So if we train an RO agent for one maze, can we transfer the knowledge to a new maze? Probably with the same NAND forms, but arranged very differently as we're showing here in these examples. In fact, we can have a combinatorial number of mazes by different combinations of these land forms, right? So it's really hard to find model level similarities. The Markov decision process can be really, really different. And, you know, although the land forms are just sand, marble, and ice, okay? So in addition, there could be some negative transfer. What do I mean by that? Let's say that the underlying MDP models are very similar. And the policy that works for the MDP model may still fail on the other similar MDPs as we actually <laughs> observe in practice. And lastly, I wanted to mention that this kind of existing work as using model level similarities often assume that they have like the state and action space to be shared between different tasks. But that's rarely the case in practice. So we wanted to understand can we actually allow knowledge transfer when the state and action space change drastically? Okay, so there, So after this motivation, I wanted to introduce one method we've been doing um, or proposed by my group. Um, so we basically use a model-based RL and utilize modular similarities. I will introduce what is model-based RL and I also introduce what we mean by modular similarities. And essentially what we did is we achieved state-of-the-art sample complexity for multitask reinforcement learning, and we work for varying state action space. Okay, so first of all, let me introduce what is model-free versus model-based RL. And here I'm showing you an example of a very popular model-free you know, method in a deep reinforcement learning setting. So model-free, 
basically directly learn the policy without building an MDP transition model. Here, very different from what we're usually thinking, like the neural network as the model. Now we actually think that the transition dynamics of the environment is the model here. So model three can still have a neural network model, but they don't directly model the transition dynamics of the environment. So we will use a neural network as the decision maker, and we will learn the decision maker directly using the standard you know, reinforcement learning loss, like a maximized accumulated reward or something like that. Okay, so this is the model three. What about model-based? Well, model-based, you know, in contraction would learn a MDP transition model of the environment and essentially face the transition dynamic model, just like what you do in a supervised learning situation. Okay, so fitting the transition dynamic model is really a supervised learning task. And the transition dynamic of a state action can be represented by a vector. And this is a very important vector. It's very important for this model-based methods, right? This vector is a concatenation of the transition probability vector and the reward corresponding to the state action pair. Okay, so, so this is an example here, like the PS1, um, you know, conditional SA just denotes the probability of transition from the S to S1 by taking action A, right? And similarly for other S2 and SS. And the more reddish the block is, the higher the transition probability is for this corresponding next state. Okay, so after doing this, you know, introduction of what is a model, a model based, I want to kind of, you know, tell you a little bit about the comparison between model free and the model based methods. Okay, so here is what I'm uh, trying, you know. So, in general, the model based methods are more sample efficient, but less computationally efficient. And model free methods are more computationally efficient, but less sample efficient. So, it seems achieving both computational efficiency and sample efficiency is really difficult. However, we would like to guarantee both sample and computational efficiency here. So we will focus on model-based methods and we're interested in obtaining so-called PAC MDP. What does that mean? It just means the polynomial number of samples required before converging to an optimal policy with very high probability, okay? All right, so as I mentioned before, we consider the modular similarities. So it's important to find the modular dynamics, right? So one state action pair can be viewed as the smallest component of the Markov decision process. And its transition dynamic can be represented by the vector as we already showed before. And you know it's a concatenation of the transition probability vector and the reward corresponding to the state action pair. <laughs> However, this is not an efficient representation since the transition probability model, uh, a vector is actually arranged in a natural and fixed order of the states because you have a fixed ordering of the states. So it can be very sparse and it may not be very easy to find any similarities between two state action pairs. So here, what we're proposing is that we define a new way of representing the dynamics, and we call it transition dynamics, or TT as you know uh, for short. So we simply rearrange the first S element of the theta with a decreasing order. So the first element of the TT is the probability of the most possible transition, and then the second most possible one, and so on. And by extracting the transition template, we focus on the relative state shift rather than the absolute state shift. So this is the intrinsic idea behind why we design such a transition template. And using the transition template, you can see we can extract much more model similarities now. Okay, so let's see in the navigation environment, again, as we already seen, we have three landforms, slippery ice, less slippery marble, now slippery sand, and so on, right? So as you can verify, actually for n-grade environment, 
you actually have three power n number of different mazes. And that's three power n number of MDPs underlying models. Okay, all are quite different from each other. So we basically cannot transfer knowledge between them if we consider model level similarities or the MDP similarities or MDP distances. <clears throat> However, if we consider similarities among landforms, we can extract the similar transition templates for all ice locations, so or all marble locations or all sand locations, so we can transfer knowledge from ice to ice, from marble to marble, from sand to sand. And this is common in real world, since the world usually controlled by some physical rules. Okay, so like gravity, friction, and so on. So let's say for two uh, state action pairs, both are sand and taking the action, you know, of going towards the center. Then the transition dynamics may look very different as I show here. If you do a rough estimation of that, they may look very different. However, if we order the vectors in a descending order, they are essentially the same as we can verify in our experiments and also in our theory. And if we cluster the rough estimation together, then we could actually augment the rough estimation and get a more accurate estimation using very small number of samples. And this way you can achieve knowledge transfer and you can also achieve sample efficiency. So the idea is really simple. Rather than extracting this model level similarities, we wanted to extract and utilize the modular similarities, lower level, state action pair similarities. Okay, so next slide, I will just show you a very brief introduction about the theory. I don't expect you to understand the notations here. The takeaway message I wanted to show is that the sample complexity or a model has a linear dependence on the cardinality of the state space, and the algorithm is more efficient than a single task learner here. Okay, so that's um, you know everything I wanted to show here. So moving on, I wanted to show you some experimental results. Actually, from this experimental results, you can see I have this online MTRO, which basically is a domain generalization setting, whereas the finite model MTRO is like a domain adaptation setting. Okay, so the experiments we show here verify the efficiency of the knowledge transfer between these two different settings, both for domain generalization and domain adaptation. As you can see here, our method kind of drastically outperformed the baselines in both settings here. Okay, so um, I also listed the paper, um, you know, at the bottom of the slides. If you're interested, you should feel free to take a look at the paper here. Um, and here, also, as I showed earlier, our method works for varying size tasks. And here we're showing that indeed, experimentally, we can verify that you can transfer knowledge even when the tasks have very different sizes. So very different state action spaces here. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, people might argue that our model is too simplistic in the sense that assuming that there is a lot of shared transition uh, templates. And here we do some you know, experiments to verify that even if the number of templates are infinite, our method still works because our method successfully transfer knowledge between tasks. In this experiment, you can sample sleeping probabilities from a mixture of Gaussian, and then the number of landforms are actually infinite. Even in this case, our method can achieve very good performance. So as long as we can cluster the templates to some degree of accuracy, we can do knowledge transfer. Um, any questions so far? So this, okay. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm showing only for the discrete state space, but you know, we could actually also working on continuous space. So, um, I didn't show that here, but it's in the paper. You can think about it as a, 
you know, feature extraction. Okay. All right, so that's the first idea we wanted to share with everyone. And then second idea is that, uh, you know, is another project we're doing using like transfer with representation learning. So in reinforcement learning, many tasks may share similar transition dynamics because the system may have to obey the basic law of physics, as we already talked about. So, however, the observation spaces of these tasks may be completely different. Here is an example I'm showing. So in a navigation environment here, right? So the source task agent above basically observe the X, Y coordinates of itself and the objective, the goal. Okay, so while the target task agent down here observe a top-down view or an image of the maze. Okay, so these are completely different observation spaces. One is a vector space, the other is a pixel space. So these two observation spaces are drastically different, but the two tasks are actually structurally very similar. So existing work do not really know how to learn such a you know, transition. How to do knowledge transfer here? So motivated by the question that if we've learned an optimal policy for a potter robot with infrared sensors, can we speed up the policy learning, right? When the sensors of a potter robot have been upgraded to cameras, for example. So our goal here, our goal here is to transfer knowledge from the source task to accelerate learning in the target task without knowing any inter-task mappings here. So no prior knowledge. All right, so what we do is we use a representation learning paradigm and split the decision-making systems into an encoder that learn a good representation of the observations and the decision-making on the representation. And then our idea is to regulate the representation learning and fit a dynamic model on the good representation when training a source task, such as a petrol robot with infrared sensors. So now after the sensor upgrade to cameras, we can transfer knowledge with the dynamic model shared from the source task and efficiently learn good representations. So essentially, uh, this has proven to be really useful, although it's a very simple idea using like a model uh, regularization, right? So it's like good representation regulated by transition dynamic model predictor. And you're able to do very effective transfer from a vector space to a pixel space. Let's see some experiments here. Um, I would like to show you this experiment of like efficient knowledge transfer shown for transferring from a vector card pool to a pixel card pool. So this has, you know, proven to be a very difficult task because, you know, what you learned using vectorized, you know, observations is really difficult to be generalized to a pixel based observation. And still you can see, you know, the green line is the oracle here. So it's essentially the vector observation. And now, you know, you can see what we have is like the pixel observation when we're doing the transfer. You can see we can almost be like as good as the oracle and well, much better than, you know, the learning from scratch without any transfer here. So basically the takeaway message of this slide is to show knowledge transfer is very successful using this very simple method of representation learning from a vector observation to pixel observations. And this paper is actually under submission right now. Okay, so again, you know, people might be curious about continuous control environments and, and you can show, you know, our method also works well in this continuous control environments when you're learning from a much simpler task and try to generalize that knowledge you learned from simpler task to a much harder task, as we're showing here in this half cheetah example. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm gonna pause for a second to see whether there are some questions. Otherwise, 
uh, we can move on to the second part of this talk. Yes. Uh, do we assume in the previous slide? Do we assume that uh, we know that these two are quite similar, such as the discrete uh, card pole and the basic single card pole? Do we assume that these are similar and then transfer? Or um, so you don't have any prior knowledge. You're not assuming anything. But since they are both, you know, uh, card pools, their physical rules are actually the same. And the idea behind that is that we believe in many of these tasks, you know, we live in the same planet, the physics is not, the physics law is not going to change in a very short period of time, at least. So we're using that as an axiom to motivate why we can do such transfer. Yeah, so the underlying dynamics is controlled by the physics rule, physics laws. Because if we assume that these two are similar and then let's say the training we do that, right, like we can do, like we can disentangle the uh, image representation with the discrete state, state of the card pool, right? Oh, so that is proven to be very difficult. If you think about it, this is because the data being no longer IID. So whatever you are trying to align with the vector space, it's gonna you know, be exponentially many examples you need in terms of horizon you run your environment on. So that's a great point. Actually, that reduces, seems like a very simple supervised learning, but reduces to an RL problem with very high sample complexity. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, let's move on to the next part of this talk. You know, now so far we talk about like you know distribution shifts, domain adaptation, and domain generalization. What about adversarial perturbations, which is a very drastic, a special case of the distribution shift? And here our group actually did some really good work in terms of understanding the vulnerabilities of our agents and how to make them robust with guarantees. So you know, in addition to this distribution shifts when domain changes. The agent could actually fail catastrophically under perturbations or adversarial attacks, including both the training time poisoning attack and deployment time evasion attack. For example, you can put stickers on traffic signs to fool the robots. And the data set you train your robots on might be images scraped from the internet, not to mention there might be some malicious insiders. Okay, so this exposed a serious vulnerability in the current RL systems. For example, in this high stake systems, healthcare systems, autonomous driving system, market making systems, you know, we simply cannot afford to allow unsafe actions or policy, which could negatively affect or even threaten our health and safety. Okay, so as the second focus of today's talk, we will evaluate the vulnerabilities of RO algorithms and design certifiable robust algorithms in RL to defend against these adversarial attacks. So to kickstart, let's review what are adversary examples very quickly. Adversary examples are the test time attacks for a very well-trained model. For example, this one show here would successfully predict this image as a grumpy cat. And now the attacker actually could tweak, compute the tweak to each pixel and add these tweaks to the image, perturbations to this image. Now the image would actually be pushed to the other side of the decision boundary and be classified as a car rather than a grumpy cat. Okay, so in terms of data poisoning is a training time attack and that controls the training data. So it works as following. If you poison some training data, so then the trained model will be poisoned and it will classify this image of airplane as a fraud, for example. All right, so to guarantee the robustness of RL algorithms, the first step, in my opinion, is to evaluate the vulnerabilities of the interaction decision-making systems where the data is no longer IID. Okay, so many existing work directly apply attacks methods in supervised learning to reinforcement learning. Although reinforcement learning is really fundamentally different from supervised learning due to the correlations in data samples and the uncertainty in the environment. For instance, some prior work would treat 
every decision making step setting a step as similarly as a classification task. So they basically ignore the data dependencies, the data samples, and think about them as IID samples. And what they do is they perturb the input state so that the agent is less likely to choose the action that it would have wanted to choose. Okay, so these attacks are myopic as I show here because they do not plan for the future. They only look at the existing time step and may not result in the strongest attacks in many cases. So this figure, I'm showing an intuitive example, right? So this myopic adversary only would prevent the agent from selecting the best action in the current step. So they will lead the agent to these two directions, but the strongest adversary can actually strategically lead the agent to a trap, as we show on the right-hand side of this image, this is a trap. So, you know, the adversary can strategically lead the agent to this trap, which is the worst event possible for this agent. It would be stuck in that trap forever, okay? So in recognition of this very unique challenges in decision-making using reinforcement learning, my group has been extending our analysis of adversarial supervised and unsupervised learning to adversarial reinforcement learning. And first, let me very quickly go through the poison attacks. So, you know, what do, um, so we, we introduced the designing of the poison attack in reinforcement learning specifically. We designed a vulnerability aware poisoning attack for online reinforcement learning with unknown dynamics. So basically, this is the first practical algorithm that poisons policy-based deep reinforcement learning methods in this understudied field. And we propose a novel vulnerability metric to characterize the stability of reinforcement learning algorithms. So part of the reason why poisoning is more challenging in reinforcement learning than in supervised learning is due to the heterogeneous victims. What do I mean by that? So for example, in RL-based recommendation systems, um, you know, which you know, think about the information of a user um, and the item as a state and the number of clicks as the reward, and you take action by recommending items. An adversary from a competitor may actually choose to manipulate the clicks, which is poisoning the reward in this round, but then switch to altering some user information, which is you know, poisoning the observations from the next round. And then you know, they could decide to insert some fake recommendations in their website, like poisoning attacks, um, or po sorry, poisoning actions in another round. Okay, so the difficulty of poisoning different poison victims varies a lot across different iterations. So this makes poisoning and reinforcement learning really challenging. And more importantly, the data is no longer IID, right? So what happens now actually affects the future. And therefore, what we did is we formulate a novel by you know, sequential bi-level optimization problem that covers all the heterogeneous poisons under the non-IID data. So the now IIDness is really captured using the sequential uh, bi-level optimization problem. So, and we kind of propose a practical poisoning algorithm based on a relaxation of the bi-level optimization problem. To answer the important question of how to attack, we kind of design an adversarial critic. We call it an adversarial critic. What does it do? So the adversarial critic would actually obtain knowledge from the learner's observations and try to mislead the learner by modifying the observation using a one-step by level optimization. Okay, so rather than the sequential one, they can you know, reduce it to a one level by level, uh, one step by level optimization. So in order to answer the important question of when to attack, we kind of propose a novel vulnerability metric and this metric would actually estimate the poison power needed to change the policy significantly. And this provides a first metric 
to measure the vulnerability of RL algorithms. So again, I put you know, the citation of the paper here. For those who are interested, you can feel free to take a look at that paper. So in this figure here, I'm showing you some experimental results, specifically the rewards of various learners under very different kinds of poison methods with very different you know, ratios of the budget to the uh, total number of iterations k. Okay, so compare with random poisoning, our proposed method like VA2CP and the simplified version ACP, which you know make the reward drop much more significantly. So basically demonstrating the effectiveness of our how to attack decision made by this adversarial critic. So um, you know VA2C uh, further outperform the ACP in almost all cases. This implies that our when to attack decision based on vulnerability aware work also works very well in practice. So an interesting observation here you can see is the random poisoning sometimes could actually facilitate the learner. And you know, as we show in this figure H here. Okay, so uh, in, 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 in this figure um, uh, B and you know, uh, C here. So this phenomenon is mainly due to the uncertainty of the environment, okay? So um, here I'm showing an animation um, of this experiments on the A2, you know, using A2C for Hopper here. So um, as you can see, our poison design, which is the first you know, poison method for online reinforcement learning achieves very good performance. You know, basically stop the hopper from hopping, whereas random noises actually, random poisons actually sometimes help with the hopping. Okay, so that is what I wanted to talk about for poisoning. Um, you know, another thing I wanted to quickly mention is like an evasion attack that's going on in my group lately. So in addition to the poisoning attack, we also introduced designing the test time evasion attacks in reinforcement learning. So you've already learned a policy and this is the deployment phase you wanted to attack that policy using the test time evasion attack so we kind of design a theoretically guaranteed optimal attack from the perspective of policy perturbation which is different from the traditional view of perturbation of states or observations which is you know currently been done in the community so this provides a theoretical understanding of the optimality of evasion attacks and allow a more efficient implementation of uh, optimal attacks. So efficiency is really important here. So, um, to, uh, so we basically propose to understand the optimal evasion attack in reinforcement learning from a policy perturbation perspective. Although the actual attack is on the state or is on the action. So it's a heterogeneous, right? But then we kind of unify it by saying, Whatever you attack, you're actually trying to attack the policy. Okay, so policy is just a mapping from a state to action in a stochastic way. All right, so this perspective really unifies the heterogeneous attack types. Um, so more importantly, for the goal of identifying optimal state adversary or optimal action adversary, we could instead identify the optimal policy perturbation. And solving the problem of finding the optimal attack in the large observation space is proven to be as difficult as an RL problem with very large state space. Yeah, it's really very difficult to um, solve. So rather than solving this very difficult RL problem, what we did is using this policy perturbation perspective and kind of decompose the problem into two smaller and simpler problems. Um, you know, one is a supervised learning problem, and another one is an easier reinforcement learning problem, which requires solving a much smaller MDP. Okay, so um, by this, this entanglement, specifically with policy perturbation, we kind of theoretically prove that the optimal attack always lie at the outermost boundary of the adversarial policy set. So you don't have to search over the entire set. You only have to search over the boundary. And this 
saves a lot of computation and make our algorithm much more efficient compared with the existing ones. So, you know, as I said, you know, as a result, compared with most heuristic based attacker methods, which are often suboptimal, we provide a theoretically guaranteed optimal attack. And then compare with theoretically optimal attack, theoretically justified optimal attack, we achieve much higher efficiency in terms of computing this optimal attack. So, you know, we kind of achieve the both of you know, the, the, the best of both worlds. So, which is, I think, a really cool result. Um, and, you know, experimentally, we actually did a very extensive experiments on various, you know, uh, environments. Here we're showing Atari games, which, you know, is a very large state space and a smaller number of action spaces. So the extensive experiments on various environments in Atari games show that our method can consistently identify the victim's vulnerability compared with the state of the art. As you can see, the result is really, really good compared with a lot of other um, you know, previous state of the art. And we also show that on continuous control environments in Mujugo games, and in Mujugo environments with continuous control, the method can also consistently identify the victim's vulnerability compared with the state of the art, as you can show in this figure here. So now we basically verified that we're able to evaluate the vulnerabilities of RO agents. Now the question is, can we do defense? Can we do certified defense based on our evaluation of these vulnerabilities? And indeed, you know, we show some experiments that we can do some robust training here. Actually, we also have a paper showing that these are essentially a certified defense in terms of guaranteed performance, but I don't have time to show that now. But in this experimental results, you can see some promising results about learning the robust RO agents that are trained to be robust to strong attacks. And in Mujugo games, so the strong attacks are actually designed by us because we're able to find the strongest attack and find the vulnerabilities of these RO agents. Right? So in Mujugo games, you can see that the RO agents trained using our method can significantly outperform the state of the art consistently. So this result, I think, is again showing that our attacks can be very useful in terms of adversarial training, and then in terms of getting you very robust RO agents. Okay, so, so finally, overall, we achieved the first certified defense for this non IID data. So now, you know, since we don't have much time, let me just quickly summarize. We talked about two things here. We talk about guaranteed speed up for real time online reinforcement learning, learning to adapt, learning to generalize. We also talked about how to design the guaranteed robust online reinforcement learning agents that are robust to these adversarial perturbations. So now please allow me in the last few minutes, allow me to introduce my group. So, First, I wanted to show you my group's interest. RO is part of our research. So rather than doing RO, we're also interested in doing, for example, network model design, deep neural network architecture design. So for example, we care about compact models, deployment in constrained devices, federated learning is one big issue that we concern right now. Attention models, Right, transformers and multi hats, you know, attention units for these very challenging AI problems. Can we find better solutions, more efficient solutions for different data types, and probably design more efficient models in terms of these, um, you know, um, attention models? And then models with uncertainty, you know, can we use confidence intervals to more confidently estimate the outcome of? these deep learning models. And as I already showed, I care about domain adaptation, domain generalization, learning to adapt, learn to you know, learn, learning to generalize. And we also do a little bit of uh, fairness and privacy research. Um, and then a big aspect of the things that we care about is adversarial attacks. 
um, as we already showed, so I don't want to go to the details here. And also the robust RL and the transfer RL we've talked about today. Okay, so this is my group in the alphabetical order. And specifically, I want to highlight Yan Chao Sun, you know, the middle uh, one, uh, the middle one lady in, you know, on the on the first row. So she is the lead of most of the RL projects I've been talking about today. So she is uh, she is fantastic. Also, Frank Zhen was uh, another undergraduate student working in our group, and he's been also contributing a lot in terms of these projects. And finally, um, I wanted to say here, you can find my email, you can find my website. Please feel free to contact me if you find any of the discussion today is interesting. And of course, a reminder, our group is not only doing RO, we also care about understanding deep neural networks from many different aspect, aspects. And thank you, everyone. We have time for questions. Uh, I don't think there's any question here. So, I mean, my office is 4104, so it's just right next to the elevator. If you wanted to talk to me, just come to my office. And I hope everyone have a good weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.